Hello, everybody. I welcome you all to today's session with MedExam Expert. Am I audible? Please, if you can unmute yourselves and give me a heads up. Okay. 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 Yeah, I got a message from Anu. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, right. Okay. So we are good to go. So, yeah, Hanifa uh, raised a hand. Any queries? Okay, no, let's proceed. So at any point of time, if I'm not being entirely clear, you have any query, just unmute yourself and ask right away. Today, I'm expecting to have a very interactive session with you all. There will be questions, there will be uh, queries, there will be questions which will be answered by uh, you as well. So I want active participation from all of you, right? So we are good to go and let's start today. So what we are about to discuss today is a very important topic related to MRCOG part two exam. The topic that we have on screen today is prevention of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy. It is green top guideline 37A, okay. So why do I say it is a very important guideline? It is very important for part two. We can expect at least two questions out of the 200 questions that we'll be facing in the exam from this particular guideline, right? And of course, there's another aspect to it that this particular guideline is not a last moment thing. We cannot mug it up in the last few days Leaving, uh, leading up to the exam because it has gotten cert certain confusing elements, certain algorithms which we need to take account of, get ourselves prepared. And then this particular guideline becomes actually really easy for you to solve. And if an EMQ also comes, there will be less and less confusion. So let's start today. Okay, so what we're actually uh, aiming today is learning the guideline in a very simplified manner. And then as we go along discussing the guideline, we aim to solve the question in segments. So there is a lot of questions that we will be discussing today as well. Just at the end of today's webinar, I have a very special gift slide from team med exam, exam expert as well as me to for all of you. It's a special offer that we have ready for you. So just stay tuned till the very end and let's have a happy reading today. So just after we do all this, I just want you all to memorize the class slides, read through the guideline, question solving from the practice book, and of course, doubt clearance, if any. Okay? So moving ahead. Every guideline has gotten certain problems regarding the facts and the numbers. We all know how much of a nightmare it actually tends to become, right? So over here, we have VTE in pregnancy, the incidence rate. We all know that such questions tend to be very bothersome, but can be asked in the exam, so we should always be prepared for that. VTE in pregnancy is about one to two per thousand in occurrence. Now just move from this point to this point. Recurrence of VTE in pregnancy. And this question has been asked in one of the practice books. It is about two to 11%. Along with that, whenever we are discussing such numbers, I would always ask my students to have a copy ready where we jot down all the numericals because numericals sadly are an integral part of our part two preparation, right? So for the numericals, have this particular note copy ready, where you have all these numbers written, one to two per thousand for VTE in pregnancy and recurrence rate is just reverse one, two, and here becomes two, one, one, right? So it is two to 11%. Just as we are discussing this, 
let me ask you do you find any recollection of this 11 number where it has been again used as an incidence rate well for your help i have it written out here it's ectopic pregnancy in uk 11 per 1000 all right and then these two are the important points which have been asked in the sessions there are certain black points also relative risk of bte in pregnancy it is about four to six fold and postpartum risk, which is five folds more than antepartum. All right. So these are some of the most important points, some of the most important aspects when we come to discussing the guideline. Apart from that, We also have a certain number of factors which are very important, which come handy when we are discussing such guidelines. Hello, excuse me. I think I've got a technical glitch at my end. Right, right, right. Yeah, and we are moving. So facts and number. LMWH reduces the risk by 60% in medical patients. This percentage is important, 60% for medical as well as 70% for surgical patients, right? Obesity. Obesity is very important because pulmonary embolism happens more than DVT in case of an obese patient. For the age factor, the risk is twofold more for women over 35 years and admission to hospital increases the risk by 18 folds. So what we can see is that this particular facts and numbers are actually important when we are discussing such guidelines. I think uh, there is a glitch at my end. The screen sharing is there, but the slides are not moving. Can the technical team help me with this? Hello? Hi, Dr. Manji. Check your uh, yeah. message, please. Check your message. I've checked my message. I've checked the chats. I've been directing that button, but somehow, the screen is not, the slides are not moving in the presentation. It's uh, still stuck to facts and numbers. Uh, hello, Dr. Manji. Uh, just hello. you can, uh, you know, yeah, just turn off the full screen mode. It, it, it's fine. We'll be using small screen for now because it's the problem at your technical side, so. Uh, okay, so? Yeah, turn off the full screen, then they'll move easily. Just use the escape button, thank you. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, it is, and it's you can better. zoom in a little bit. Okay, okay, right. Is it visible to you all? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. It is quite visible. We can use it okay. like right this for now. Okay. Is it clear to the participants? Can somebody please unmute and respond? Yes, it is clear. Thank you. Okay. It is visible, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. So moving on. We will start with one of the most relevant and easier part of the guidelines as to which anticoagulant which we need to use. Now to it, we all know about LMWH for sure, right? This is something we have come across in all our questions. 
But then moving forward, there are certain other aspects also like unfractionated heparin, danaparoid, pondoparinux, and warparin. We will take this up and discuss them in details one by one. But before we start anticoagulation, this is a very particular important thing that we need to know that we need to have a baseline screening run for all of our patients in terms of pool but blood count, coagulation screening, urea, electrolytes, as well as liver function test. In fact, what you can see over here is I've written that there was an EMQ in get through book regarding the same. This particular test, which we need to do before we start any patient on anticoagulation, okay? So moving forward regarding LMWH, this is one of the excerpts from the guideline itself. LMWH are the agents of choice for both antenatal as well as postnatal prophylaxis. The dose are based on the weight. The weight would be the booking weight or the most recent weight that can be used to guide the dosing, right? So whenever the patient comes, the booking weight or any of the relevant weights, generally to make our life easier, the questions in the exams will generally point at only one particular weight. So no worries there, right? Now, this yellow highlight highlighted points, what are they supposed to uh, related to? It is about what all we need to monitor when we are using any kind of anticoagulation therapy. For unfractionated heparin, we need to monitor platelet count. And for LMWH, we need to monitor platelet count only when the patient has had a prior exposure to unfractionated heparin, right? Monitoring of anti-10A levels. It is not required for any patient with LMWH therapy if it is for prevention part but it will be required to monitor the anti levels if we are treating the patient, okay? So for treatment, we will monitor. For prophylactic dosage, we won't be monitoring. Is it clear to all of you? Okay, so the dose of LMWH should be reduced in patients who, are, who have got renal impairments, okay? LMWH is of course safe in breastfeeding for that reason, we are always using it in postnatal thromboprophylaxis. So just to have a thorough overview, for unfractionated heparin, we monitor the platelet count. For LMWH, anti-10A levels, all right? Now, we are moving to one of the aspects of today's discussion, which tend to be a bit more confusing for you all the dosage for prophylaxis. The dosage for prophylaxis, all these numbers may appear daunting to you, but these are very easy if we can split it down in a very simplified manner. So these are all the prophylactic dosage. The treatment dosage is an entirely separate guideline. Today, we are only discussing the prevention part. Body weight is in this column. The body weight is increasing by 40 units, as you can see. It's less than 50, 50 to 90, 90 to 130, and 131 to 170, okay? Then we have this column where the enoxaparin dosage are actually getting monitored. It is 20 milligram per day, and then there is a 20 increment from 20, and then it becomes 40, then 60, and then 80. Is it clear to you all? Can you all see the slides very clearly? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. So enoxaparin is something that is very frequently asked in the exam, but there had been question in one of the instances from daltiparin dosage. So let's have a look at daltiparin dosage. We will start with 2,500 unit daily, increment by, five, by 2,500 more, making it 5,000, then 7,500 and finally 10,000. So here it is increasing by 40, enoxaparin increasing by 20, daltiparin increasing by 2,500, right? And then we go on to tinzaparin. Now with tinzaparin, I have not come across such questions to the best of my knowledge. No questions have been asked so far, but you never know. Let's get prepared for it as well. 
3,500 is the dosage that we start daily. We double it and make it 7,000 in the next slab. 4,500 unit and we double it and make it 9,000 in the next slab. So this is how whenever a dosage for prophylaxis kind of a question will come in the exam. In the exam, the question will be on the screen. There will be a small piece of paper for your rough work always tend to work it out like this because it is not humanly possible to remember all this at a glance. Just tend to work it out by starting from 50, adding 40, starting from 20, adding 20, and then doubling over here and doubling in every alternate slide. Now, why have I particularly highlighted this row? This is because 50 to 90 kg is usually what we face this particular age uh, weight group patients in our day to day practice. So these are the most commonly used dosage. But this particular arrow is indicating what is most commonly asked in exam. They will not ask you very frequently from this column. They will ask you from this particular row, 90 to 130 kg. That is most frequently asked. So always try to remember this particular set of values. Or you can work it out also on the day of the exam. Now, to make life easier, we consider prophylactic dose as one milligram per kg once daily and therapeutic dose as one milligram per kg twice daily. Okay. There is also a question relating to this in the get through book of EMQ, where the answer is 1.5 milligram per kg once daily. All right. So, moving on, we will be now discussing about unfractionated heparin. Now, unfractionated heparin is only preferred in certain cases over LMWH. Why is it not always used? Because it has got a problem regarding uh, one of the side effects. It is, that is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. But suppose there is a case where the patient has a mechanical heart valve. The patient definitely needs an anticoagulation, but she is about to deliver as well. And we cannot have LMWH given to her in a very close interval to delivery because then the patient will tend to bleed more. In such cases, we shift the patient to unfractionated heparin in the peripartum period. That is just before and right after delivering the baby. It is an ideal time for unfractionated heparin because it has a very short half-life. It can be uh, stopped and the effects will disappear just like that, but that is not such a flexibility with LMWH. So these are the only situations where we prefer unfractionated heparin. If we are using unfractionated heparin, then we definitely need to monitor what? The platelet count. And how do we monitor? We monitor every two to three days, starting from day four to 14, and we go up till we stop heparin, okay? Why days 4 to 14, not before days 4? Because HIT or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia actually does take a little bit of time to set in. All right. So moving on about danaparoid. Now, whenever we are using a term like danaparoid or oid, oid means like. Like means not as in like Facebook like or Instagram like. It's about to resemble in Latin. Okay, so it is a heparinoid. That is, danaparoid is a heparinoid. That is, it is resembling heparin. It can be used in cases where out and out we cannot give heparin therapy to patients. But still, we can use the heparin like molecules that is danaparoid. There is very little data regarding this, but it is apparently safe in pregnancy and lactation. Once again, we haven't seen questions from this, but it is good to know. It is there in the guideline. Ponder Parinux, focus on this particular letter, X. It is X and here we have 10. So Ponder Parinux is actually a factor 10A inhibitor, okay? It is used in cases where patients are so much intolerant that they cannot take heparin. They are not comfortable with heparinoids also. So all these patients are ideal candidates for Ponda Parinux. Now there is a common misconception that we give aspirin. We do give aspirin, but we give aspirin not for thromboprophylaxis. 
we give it so that a better vascularizer, vascularization is established. And that is the only reason aspirin is recommended, but it is not recommended in thromboprophylaxis. And so it is not important for us in this particular guideline. Dextrin and NOAX, these are never recommended. Dextrin not recommended because it has got anaphylactoid reactions. NOAX are not recommended because they are avoided in pregnancy and lactation. They are not the most comfortable choice for us. All right. Now, the next slide that we have is a question for you all. What is the calf pressure recommended in anti-embolism stockings? This is not something we have not discussed. There is no rationale where we can figure out what much should be the pressure. This is something that just we need to mug up. So please, can anybody guess? Can anybody come up with any answer? Let's just be active and discuss. Yes, any wild guess? Any option that you would like to choose? Okay, yeah, we have a, a few options. C, D, okay. Thank you for participating. But the answer is B. So for calf pressure recommendation in anti-embolism stockings, we will go with 14 to 15 millimeter of mercury. All right, all right. Okay, so moving on. Now we have come to a topic, warfarin. With warfarin, everybody would be happy because, yeah, we, we know a little bit about warfarin. We know that it should be stopped within two weeks of missed periods, that is six weeks of pregnancy. Okay, then we can restart warfarin, but five to seven days after delivery. As to why do we wait and don't start it immediately? That is because it is one of the stronger variants of anticoagulation and may tend to lead uh, tend to form hematomas. So we wait for five to seven days after delivery to restart warfarin in patients who actually very much require warfarin. Now regarding warfarin embryopathy, what is the incidence? It is about 5%. What is the most risky time for exposure that is within six to 12 weeks of pregnancy exposure because it is the period of organogenesis right now this particular aspect is very important with dose more than five milligram per day warfarin embryopathy with dose more than five milligram per day this is something i want you all to have your attention suppose there is a question you're seeing that there is something mentioned or warfarin in the question, you're seeing in one of the options, it is mentioned that stop warfarin and you are very happy and you're just marking stop warfarin. But take a breath, take a pause, look at the dosage. Suppose the question mentions that the patient is taking warfarin three milligram per day and she got pregnant. It is fine. She can continue. There's no harm in that. Only if the mentioned dose more than five milligram, that is six and up, that is the only situation where we will suggest that the patient has to be shifted to any other variety of anticoagulant. All right. Are we clear on this so far? So about warfarin embryopathy. Warfarin embryopathy, I just want you all to remember this particular picture. Can you see the dip in the nose of the baby over here? This is point number one hypoplasia of nasal bridge. Then there are two points which are related to the brain, agenesis of corpus callosum and ventricular begally. All right. This typical picture is actually representing chondrodysplasia punctata, that is stippled epiphysis. That is the epiphysis, the appearance, it is dotted like, okay. So this is one of the side effects of and one of the manifestations rather of warfarin embryopathy. Along with that, we have congenital heart defects. So any of these combination of factors may come in a single best answer. So just take a note and try to memorize, keeping in mind this picture. Okay, so if you are following me, if you have any doubts so far, please feel free to ask because now we will be beginning antenatal prophylaxis and I need all of you to be very focused and attentive to figure out how to solve questions on that. So till now, is there any doubt? 
Is there any question, please? Okay. Okay. So considering that we are good to go, I'll move forward with antenatal prophylaxis. So who are the candidates for antenatal prophylaxis? First and foremost, who are the high-risk patients? Any patient comes in your clinic and tells you that, yes, I have had a previous history of venous thromboembolism. Well, then and there, then and there, there is a risk factor. That is a red flag for sure. A history of VTE. That is definitely a high risk factor. However, always take note, except a single event related to major surgery. If the patient had a VTE after a major surgery, then the patient will be a intermediate risk, not a high risk. Also take note of this point, single event. If the question is telling you that there has been two, three episodes of VTE, that is a case of recurrent VTE, no matter whether it is after a major surgery or not, it will definitely be a high-risk patient, all right? So how do we treat this particular high-risk group? They require thromboprophylaxis from booking visit as well as the expert team opinion. That is, a hematologist needs to be involved in their management. And from the very booking visit, we have to give them prophylactic dose of LMWH. And this particular therapy needs to be continued for them till six weeks after delivery. All right. So moving on. There is another category who are called the very high risk patients. So high risk, we are clear on that. But who exactly are the very high risk patients? Any patient who has got a history of VTE along with diseases like or disorders like antithrombin 3 deficiency or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, that is APLA. Okay. Any patient who has a previous history of VTE and is still continuing anticoagulants and has gotten pregnant. Okay. And of course, any patient who is having a mechanical heart valve and is on anticoagulant and is pregnant right now, they all classify as very high risk group. They will require antenatal high dose LMWH. What do we mean by high dose LMWH? The guideline mentions it is 50 to 75% of the treatment dose. It has to be given twice a day. It has to be started from booking visit like we started in the high-risk patients, it has to be continued till six weeks after delivery. And of course, expert team opinion, that is the hematologist opinion, need to be sought in this particular case. Okay? So that goes for high-risk and very high-risk. Now, just to lighten our mood up, let's discuss the case of Mrs. Adams. Mrs. Adams came to the doctor. The doctor asked, have you had any kind of risk factors? Mrs. Adams says, yes, I have had a history of PTE. And yes, I'm pregnant right now. That goes without saying. That is why she came to the obstetrician. So she's pregnant and she is telling she has got a history of PTE. The doctor asks, was it after any of the surgeries that you had? Mrs. Adams said, no, it was not after a surgery. I just had a history of PTE. So it was not related to a surgery. So that makes Mrs. Adams a high-risk patient, all right? Now the doctor needs to know whether this high-risk patient has got any other factors that we need to take care of. So he asked her to get checked. And she got checked and suppose she has got antithrombin 3 deficiency or APLA. Then she will be classified as a very high-risk patient, all right? This image is... This story is basically for your understanding. Of course, when a patient is coming to you with pregnancy, we do not check her at that point of time for APLA. We cannot scream right that moment at that point of time. But this is for your understanding that we are discussing this story so that you remember that whenever a patient comes and we know that she has a history of BTE, 
that is a high risk patient whenever the blood test and everything has confirmed that she has got any of the disorders then the patient classifies as a very high risk patient all right so then who all are the intermediate risk patients we will assign each of them a score of 3 and we will consider intermediate risk patients to start antenatally thromboprophylaxis by LMWH from 28 weeks so for high risk and very high risk it was from the booking visit itself but for the intermediate risk it has to be started from 28 weeks of gestation and likewise it has to be continued till 6 weeks of delivery okay so what are the risk factors first and foremost is hospital admission by admission we mean that the patient is staying there for 3 days or more right then there is single episode of vte after major surgery this point we have discussed high risk thrombophilia well who all are the high risk thrombophilias who all are the low risk thrombophilias we will discuss to that in the upcoming slides right then there are certain medical comorbidities of the medical comorbidities just take a note cancer heart failure that is fine but active sle if the question is asking you that there is a patient with sle in remission will it be a intermediate risk score no it has to be active sle right then suppose the question mentions that the patient has type 1 diabetes and fleetingly you remember yes diabetes was there it was intermediate risk but no the patient will only become intermediate risk if she has diabetes and she has nephropathy along with that okay okay i have a question from dr nahim uh, that how many of these factors are needed we are coming to that we are coming to that if suppose uh, for initiating thromboprophylaxis from 28 weeks if any of these factors are present that is good to start uh, prophylaxis from 28 weeks right then there will be combination of factors which we will discuss when we go to the when we have discussed all the other factors as well okay so have i answered your question okay so for any of these factors suppose the patient is coming and saying that she has a high risk thrombophilia or if she has any surgery during pregnancy except for appendectomy then that makes her intermediate risk and that is a score 3 and then we start from 28 weeks straight forward and continue till 6 weeks of delivery okay but then there is another point ohss why ohss and why there is a star mark behind uh, just after it we will be discussing that okay we will be discussing that yeah i have got an answer yeah actually you're right ohss is score 4 score 4 because it is one of the first trimester factors that we will be discussing in the upcoming slides if we follow the algorithm at the end of the gtg you will see that it is been uh, uh, discussed in one of the first trimester in intermediate score ohss but it is one of the first trimester factors as you, as somebody else had rightly pointed out okay why did you exclude appendectomy well it is as the guideline go, goes okay appendectomy as per the guideline won't be considered as an intermediate risk that is we won't be starting thromboprophylaxis directly from 28 weeks right okay so now we will be moving on to the low risk factors so is the screen visible to all i am just zooming in a bit okay so low risk factors now for each of these long list of factors we scored the patient one okay so smoking obesity age parity preeclampsia varicose veins family history of vte in first degree relative immobility immobility means uh, paraplegia it can mean pelvic girdle pain as well pelvic girdle pain is a very nagging painful complaints that some patients have due to laxity of joints during pregnancy and it is actually immobilizing that will also come under immobility ivf low risk thrombophilia multiple pregnancy okay 
Okay, yeah, what about appendicectomy during antenatal period? See, whatever factors we are discussing over here in the intermediate risk category, these are actually for the antenatal period only. These are not about the history. Okay, these are all about, these are all about having any active surgery during while she's pregnant. Okay, it's not about any background history that, see, if we consider like that, then many, many women, in our everyday lives have got a past history of surgery. It's not the history of surgery that comes. That comes. Suppose a mother who is uh, 20 weeks pregnant, she has come to us and she has also uh, has got gallstones. She needs a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That will be an intermediate risk for her, okay? But if the mother comes to us at 20 weeks and she has a history of, uh, and not a history, she is now getting an appendicectomy done, then that won't be an intermediate risk for Okay, are you getting my point? Yes. Okay, yeah, somebody has shared the algorithm. Yes, there is this algorithm in the guideline. And as per that, it is about the fresh history and uh, that is something ongoing antenatally, but not in the past. It is not about the past surgical histories, all right? Okay, so about the low risk factors. There are many, many factors, as you can see. So what is smart studying? Smart studying is we make a mnemonic out of it. This mnemonic is soap versus film. Well, if we make a mnemonic out of it, how our life goes easier? Because if we don't do it that way, then in the fetal goat restriction guideline also, we will get another similar list of risk factors. Then on the day of the exam, there are so many guidelines in mind, there are so many lists in mind, then all those scoring tends to get confused. So SOAP versus film is the, is the mnemonic. Look at each of these factors. Obesity, BMI 30 and above will be score one. But once BMI touches 40, 40, the BMI will be 40, then it will become score two. Age more than 35. That is important, not more than equal to. If the age is 36, that will be score one. If the age is 35, no scoring. 34, no scoring, all right? Similarly, parity, preeclampsia, all these factors need to be taken into account. Suppose there are four of these risk factors. When we come to the practice questions, it will become uh, very easy for you all. Suppose a patient is a smoker and her age is 37 and she has preeclampsia, and she has, suppose, uh, immobility in terms of hospital admission. Uh, not in terms of hospital admission, maybe, uh, just immobility in terms of pelvic girdle pain. Then there are four factors. Then prophylaxis from the first trimester to six weeks after delivery, okay? So any of the combination of these four factors will make her a candidate for prophylaxis from the very first trimester to six weeks after delivery. If suppose her age is 38, she has obesity, BMI is 31, and she is a smoker. Three factors. Then from 28 weeks gestational age to six weeks after delivery, because she is a score three. You remember how in score three in intermediate risk, we were discussing that score three will be from 28 weeks to six weeks after delivery, all right? Then if there are two risk factors or less, suppose she is a smoker and now she has a twin pregnancy, all right? So for that, we don't need to put anticoagulant therapy, but we have to make sure that the patient has adequate hydration after delivery, uh, adequate hydration all through antenatally and also after delivery and in the intrapartum period as well, and that she is adequately mobilized, that she is not uh, taking too much of rest or getting bedridden at any point of time during the pregnancy. Okay, so I have a question from Saira. Score uh, need 10 days for LMWH. Uh, which score need 10 days for LMWH? No, 10 days for LMWH, that is postnatally. Okay, I think you're uh, confusing with antenatal and postnatal prophylaxis. Now we are discussing antenatal prophylaxis, okay? We will come to the postnatal prophylaxis and the scoring, 
Okay, yeah, you got my point. We will come to postnatal. So this is why I told you that this is going to be a very active discussion. This is going to, I need to have your attention thoroughly. These up to this, so much of agony, so much of discussion, so many points, so many slides, and we are still with antenatal. But I promise you, things will get easier. Things will be really easy when we are done discussing this. All right. So these are actually the antenatal points. Okay. So as promised earlier, I'll discuss about the thrombophilias. Because remember, we discussed high-risk thrombophilias, which are intermediate risk high-risk thrombophilias, right? So they are the intermediate risk factors. And there are low-risk thrombophilias as well, which come under low-risk category. All right? All right? Okay. So now we need to know, in the question, they won't put high-risk thrombophilia. In the question, they won't put low-risk thrombophilia. They will be putting the names of this particular disorders that the patient is having. So we need to know, what are the high-risk ones? Whenever there are a combination of twos, the two genes, homozygous factor V lead-in, the two proteins, protein C, protein S, these are the high-risk ones. This is just a kind of a mnemonic for you to remember. And rest of it, the prothrombin gene mutation, factor V laden uh, heterozygous, APLA, these will all come under low-risk category. All right? So that is how we categorize thrombophilias. So now moving on, as we have discussed earlier, the first trimester risk factor. I think Dr. Saira was there, was telling me about the first trimester risk factor. Yes, hyperemesis. Hyperemesis is a condition where we will definitely consider LMWH when the patient is admitted with us. So make note of this point. Hyperemesis patient, you're managing on an outpatient basis, does not need thromboprophylaxis, but once you're admitting the patient with hyperemesis, definitely start with LMWH. And once she is getting discharged, the hyperemesis symptoms have resolved, then we will discontinue, okay? It's not one of the criteria where we start and we go on till she delivers. We won't do that. We will discontinue when she gets better. Similarly for OHSS, as we discussed, we consider to start from first trimester. And there is a catch point to it. OHSS is more prone to form clots in the upper part of the body. In the upper body, there will be more thromboembolism. Normally, we find more thromboembolism in the iliac veins, right, in pregnancy. But OHSS is the only situation where we find more cl clots in the upper body, okay? So this is another tidbit. Now we move on to postnatal prophylaxis. So far, antenatally, whatever we had discussed, I think it is clear. Now, postnatal prophylaxis is a bit easier. I promise it will definitely feel a lot easier if you have followed the antenatal part. Okay. So, what are the high risk factors? At the very starting, let me tell you postnatally, we don't have a very high risk group. We have high risk intermediate risk and low risk. We don't have a very high risk group. Okay, so okay, we are happy. We don't have four groups, we have three groups. So who are the high risk patients? A patient who has a previous VTE, definitely a high risk patient. High risk thrombophilia. Antenatally, this factor was one of the intermediate risk factors. Postnatally, it is one of the high risk factors. Okay, low risk thrombophilia. Where was it antenatally? Antenatally, low-risk thrombophilia alone was a low-risk factor. Okay, are you being able to recall the charts which we have shown? Okay, but postnatally, low-risk thrombophilia along with the family history will become one of the high-risk factors. If they ask you, the patient is presenting to you after delivery, she only has prothrombin gene mutation. That won't be high risk. She has prothrombin gene mutation. She presents to you after delivery. Her mother had had a history of VTE. That will be a high risk factor. Okay. And of course, if a patient has taken antenatal LMWH all through, then of course, that patient will also be a high risk factor. So these two are 
of course, but obvious. Previous VTE and taken antenatal LMWH, but obvious they will be high risk factors, but obvious that we will continue for six weeks after delivery. But high risk thrombophilia, low risk thrombophilia with family history. These are different categories antenatally and postnatally. So always look in a question whether the patient is pregnant right now, whether the patient has delivered, because that is where mistakes happen. Okay, so for high risk, we are continuing at least six weeks after delivery, right? Now moving on to intermediate risk. Intermediate risk is, suppose a patient has cesarean section in labor. In labor, we mean in active labor, all right? Suppose a patient has BMI more than equal to 40, that is a BMI of 40 and above. The patient is getting readmission, okay? the patient is having prolonged admission. Readmission means that the patient had delivered, she had gone home and now she has come back. Prolonged admission is that she is she has delivered and is admitted for more than three days because normally under NHS, they don't tend to keep the patients for so long. We have got different practice across the globe, but whenever, a cesare whenever any delivered patient is staying for more than three days with NHS, that will be considered for prolonged admission. All right, surgery in purpareum. Again, that is important. Surgery in purpareum is surgeries like laparotomy. Suppose there is a uh, perineal tear that is getting repaired, any grading, but not an episiotomy repair, okay? If they have put somewhere in the question that there is an episiotomy repair, you don't consider it surgery in purpareum, all right? And of course, medical comorbidities. What are the medical comorbidities? They are the same medical comorbidities we had antenatal, antenatally, okay? Uh, those risk factors, this particular slide that we had shared earlier. These are the medical comorbidities. They were intermediate there. They are intermediate here as well, all right? So for this intermediate risk factors, we will start and uh, we will continue thromboprophylaxis at least for 10 days. And then what happens? At the end of 10 days, we reassess the patient. We reassess if she is still admitted with us. If these factors are still persisting, then we will consider extending the prophylaxis and we will keep on scoring the patient. All right. Then we will be moving on to the low risk category. Thankfully, this is a done and sorted chart. This is the same list which we had antenatally, the same list we have postnatally, okay? The mnemonic that we had before. But along with that, we have certain other low risk factors. That is the mode of birth. Mode of birth, always note. Suppose a patient has a straightforward vaginal birth, a pool birth, okay? Because that is very common in NHS no complications, then there is no scoring, all right? Suppose the patient has forceps delivery, score one. Suppose the patient has elective cesarean section, then score one. And then a cesarean section in labor, then that would be score two, all right? So cesarean section will get you a score, one or two. Vaginal delivery, straightforward, no scoring. If it is a forceps, then it will be score one, all right? Now, prolonged labor for more than 24 hours, PPH, one liter more or more, or transfusion, all right? If the patient has received blood transfusion, blood and blood products, that will be also considered a scored one. Preterm birth and stillbirth. So, when we are adding up the charts and we are calculating, we will take these factors as all of each of them will get a scored one, and then also how she has delivered, what all were the delivery events that will also be taken into account. And by combining this course, we will have the risk factor scoring. Suppose if she has two or more factors, that is two and above, then she has to have a prophylaxis of at least 10 days, less than two. That is, if she has a single factor, then only early mobilization, adequate hydration. We don't give anticoagulation to this group of patients. All right. So I think with that, 
we are done with one of the very confusing and significant portion. But are we ready for a quiz? Um, I think we are, though the chat box is silent, everybody is muted, but I still feel that we are ready for the quiz. And so with question solving only, we will get more and more clear on the concepts. Okay, so here comes the first question. Just have a look. A 28-year-old primary gravita with a BMI of 42 had an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. Don't start looking at the options, okay? Just fragment your question, okay? Thank you, uh, Dr. Malakia. You are ready. Everybody is ready. Anybody who is ready with the answer can just unmute themselves or maybe in the chat box, whichever way you are comfortable. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we are getting answers. We are getting answers, right? So 28, let's just fragment up the question. 28, age, is that a problem? Not a problem. Primary gravida, is that a problem? Not a problem. Okay. BMI, yes, that's a problem. But BMI of 42, that would be? Score? Score two. Score two, right. And uncomplicated vaginal delivery. So all in all, the patient has score two. So yes, consider prophylactic LMWH for 10 days. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you're all correct, all correct. Hanifa, Mishpa, I can see. Yeah, all of you came up with the right answer. So yeah, so we have got the hang of the guideline. We are able to solve questions. So let's move on to the next question. Just fragment it up. A 35-year-old pregnant woman with a history of previous VTE associated with APLA, presence at eight weeks of gestation with hyperemesis gravidarum. She was admitted for rehydration and antiemetics. Too many red flags. The question is buzzing with buzzwords, okay? Too, too many buzzwords, okay? Let's see, let's see. Yes, yes, yes. I'm really happy. I'm really happy with you all. Yeah, exactly. Saira, Malak, Snobia. I think I'm getting the name pronounced right. Hanifa, Mishpa. Yeah, 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 really. Everybody has gotten it right. It has to be high-dose antenatal LMWH. Okay. If at all, if there is a question framed like this, and suppose this A option is not there, okay? Then you will choose this option, LMWH antenatally and for six weeks postpartum, all right? If suppose they don't mention high dose, but they're just mentioning LMWH antenatally and for six weeks postpartum, then that would be the next best choice. But if they have given mm -hmm. high dose, definitely go for it. Yes, somebody is on mute. Do you have a question? Yes, please. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, I'm very happy all of you have gotten ahead with the right answer. Okay. So, moving forward, moving forward, our third question. Okay. So, just fragment up the question. 41 year old. All right. 41. Yes, that's a problem. Score one. Gives birth to her first baby. First baby. Not a problem. Okay. Vaginal delivery. All right. Vaginal delivery. Not a problem. Complicated by 1.2 liter PPH. Yes. That's a problem. This score one more. That is now the score is two. Her booking weight was 96 kgs. Okay. We have an answer in the chat box. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's continue. Let's continue analyzing. Her booking weight was 96 kgs. Okay, we take note of that. And BMI is 34. That is BMI more than 30. Okay, then again, there is a third score that she is getting, score three. She is a smoker, score four. So now she is already at score four. And whatever options we have, that is about the postnatal prophylaxis, okay? So this is a postnatal patient. This is a postnatal prophylaxis and score four. So we know there has to be six weeks. Whatever we give, we have to give it uh, six weeks. 
right okay okay now regarding which particular dosage which particular dosage 96 kg so 6 weeks is option b and option d but 40 or 60 that will be 96 kg and i told you that 90 to 130 is something that very frequently comes up in our questions all right so 96 kg would be 60 mg so that would be option d all right so just let me have a look okay 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 whoever were a uh, rooting for c i think one of the factors somewhere down the line in the question you have missed out so just to make you more vigilant about it whenever you get such questions read every line very thoroughly just break up your question okay break up your question in small small segments the age the parity everything so that you don't miss anything all right okay so we are done with that okay and we are done and we are clear i think with one of the very confusing parts of this particular guideline now we are moving to another aspect now now life gets easy this is one of the relatively easier aspects that we have okay dosage timings i want you to forget rest of the slide rest of the chart i just want you to focus on these three numbers 24 12 and 4 all right 24 12 and 4 now you see dose timings that is how it is important why it is important is that whenever a patient is on anticoagulation she is having a risk of bleeding we all know as surgeons a patient has gotten aspirin a patient has gotten lmwh and we are very scared okay we have to have a certain amount of period elapsed before we dare to touch the patient but still we do operations but what becomes very very fatal for the patient if the patient develops a spinal hematoma so for this kind of patients on anticoagulation whether or not we are pricking the spine that is your buzzword here right pricking the spine whether or not we are pricking the spine is becoming very important pricking the spine in terms of regional anesthesia that is spinal anesthesia epidural anesthesia and even removal of an epidural catheter so all these need to be timed for us all right so 24 12 and 4 and that will sort our life 24 hours before the th after the therapeutic lmwh we can proceed with pricking the spine okay so 24 hours for therapeutic lmwh and for profi prophylactic lmwh it is 12 hours all right if you just make a mental note of this particular slide it will become easy how the color coding we have done and then 4 hours after regional anesthesia always after 4 hours we are good to go always after 4 hours from removal of epidural catheter we are good to go problem is only in the previous part just after regional anesthesia 4 hours later we are good to go however there is another pitfall there is another pitfall over here just follow this algorithm therapeutic lmwh the patient was on therapeutic lmwh suppose she had a case of pulmonary embolism while she was suppose 36 weeks pregnant and she was in the hospital she was rushed in she had pulmonary embolism we got we diagnosed her we put her on therapeutic lmwh and now the baby is having suppose meconium stain like her we need to deliver okay and for delivery we are thinking of spinal anesthesia so therapeutic lmwh ha has been given to the patient on suppose 8 am today after 24 hours that is 8 am tomorrow we are good to go for regional anesthesia okay so 8 am next day cesarean section done 4 hours later 12 noon we will restart but we will restart with prophylactic lmwh we won't directly start therapeutic to therapeutic we will go from therapeutic and then we will restart with prophylactic and then eventually there is a time frame given 6 to 9 hours where we will again shift back to therapeutic 
but the initial dose will always be prophylactic lambda-WH. See, no questions have come this complicated from this particular slide, but I think it is worth mentioning, it is worth highlighting because you never know when they come up with a question and we think that it is an easy question and we get the question wrong, okay? Okay, so moving on. Moving on, there is this question, are we ready to have it solved? Okay, can you explain again? Okay, 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 so Sabina, was it right? Yeah, therapeutic case, all right, okay. Suppose we have a patient who presented to us at 36 weeks of pregnancy with severe dyspnea. She was brought to the emergency. She was 36 weeks pregnant and they never knew what was causing the dyspnea, but we diagnosed her that she is having embol pulmonary embolism. To save her life, we started on therapeutic LMWH then and there and shifted her to ICU. We were monitoring her in ICU and LMWH was being given in therapeutic dosage, all right? Suddenly, the baby starts to have fetal distress, okay? Maybe there was a rupture of membrane, maybe uh, it was meconium stained like her and okay, we need to put her up for cesarean section. The cervix is not favorable for this patient. So, suppose 8 a.m. today, we have given her therapeutic LMWH 2 p.m. today, suddenly the patient's membrane rupture and we find meconium stained like And it's thin meconium or something, we can still wait. We are doing CTG, we are monitoring the fetal distress. Okay, fine, we can still keep on continuing from the fetal aspect, okay? So suppose 8 a.m. today, we had received therapeutic LMWH. Then 8 a.m. tomorrow is the ideal time when we can prick her spine and we will be safe. We will prick her spine at 8 a.m. tomorrow and we will deliver by cesarean section. All right. Now, 8 a.m. tomorrow, we have done the cesarean section. Now, how to restart LMWH? Because it's a therapeutic LMWH. It was life-saving for the mother. She was in ICU. She had pulmonary embolism. All right. So we need to restart. But first, we need to restart with prophylactic LMWH four hours later from the surgery, all right? So whenever a patient is on prophylactic LMWH and we are thinking that we will continue till six weeks after delivery, all those scoring patients, prophylactic LMWH, regional anesthesia, and we go back to prophylactic LMWH, okay? But for therapeutic LMWH, we will restart with prophylactic and then shift to therapeutic. Okay, Sabina has given a heads up and Okay, and you should not remove the epidural catheter within 12 hours after the last dose. Yeah, for prophylactic, that's it. We won't be removing the catheter 12 hours after the last dose. Okay, so now we were moving forward to a question. Okay. Dr. Mitra, I have a question. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Please go if ahead. we need to deliver the baby urgently, like already mm -hmm. the patient was given the therapeutic dose, then what to mm -hmm. do? Yes, that is there in one of the questions in the upcoming slides. Okay. Always remember the buzzword. We cannot prick the spine now. All right. Such situations arise with us. We cannot prick the spine now. It will be a giveaway if I give out the answer right now, but then... Just to give you a hint, we cannot prick the spine, but without pricking the spine, can we deliver by cesarean section? Yes, we by can. GA. Exactly. You got your answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 We will have that question. Just the, I think a couple of slides later, we have that question. Okay. We already have Dr. Saira telling us, okay, one of the answers. Okay, anybody else coming up with any different answer? Okay, when we started discussing, okay, I always say that for this timing related question, your buzzword is pricking the spine, pricking the spine. Okay, Mishma is also say, telling C. Only one hint, pricking the spine. 
any different answer do we have? Pricking the spine. Okay, okay, just let's see. Women with BMI 41. Okay, uh, not needed after birth. Okay, yeah, Dr. Mevish, Mehbooba, they're all thinking um, in a direction, but yeah, you have got you have uh, got the hint, but okay, let's just analyze this question together. Okay, women with BMI of forty one, red flag. Yes, score would be two. Okay, yeah, 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 Doctor Malak, I have your answer. I'll take your answer. Yeah, yeah. So this is a kind of a two part kind of a question. Okay, BMI is forty one. Forty one makes her score two. Age is 38, score becomes three. Three previous normal birth, okay? So definitely with so many factors, she will need, she will need to continue thromboprophylaxis after birth, all right? So E is not the answer. Not needed after birth is not the answer. There are too many red flags. The score is already up. So yeah, yeah, everybody is now getting the point. Yeah, but why we were delaying? We were delaying because we have pricked the spine. We are delaying because we don't want a spinal hematoma. But in this particular case, she had an un uncomplicated pool birth in midwifery-led care. Let me tell you, in NHS, midwifery-led care is a kind of a setup. Uh, you will come across this in your labor module as well. We will discuss all that. Where uh, there is so much amenity that the patient will... Uh, deliver, she can have a straightforward delivery, can have a pool birth, but under the care of a midwife. And if she needs regional anesthesia, if she wants epidural, then she has to be shifted to a higher center. Okay. So uncomplicated pool birth, no epidural given. So we can do start with our LMWH therapy at any point of time. Okay. So this was a kind of a trick question, but uh, just to make you all understand how we are approaching the question, okay? So always remember, pricking the spine, not prick the spine. So we are good to go at any point of time. And we will also take note of these factors. These are the risk factors. Yep, they are present. So not needed after birth is not an option. All right. Okay. So okay. Dr. Mitra, I, I, I have yeah. a question. Um, okay. The thing is like, just after delivery, we are going to um, score again for the for the postpartum and we'll start as soon as possible. Yeah, because see, that is why I segmented our topic today into antenatal prophylaxis and postnatal prophylaxis. The score, the low risk factors, they all remain the same. But one more factor gets added, how she delivers. If we go up to the slide, of the postnatal factors, you can see these are the low risk low risk scores for postnatally. They are also similar antenatal factors. Okay, the low risk discharge, the so versus film remaining, remains the same. But along with this particular set, we also need to add this particular slide calculations. Okay, if there was PPH, if there was forceps, all this will contribute to her scoring. All right. So, yes, of course, once a patient delivers, we again need to reassess. We will yeah, continue yeah. for six K. Yeah, we will. Exactly. We will continue for six weeks. That was not part of the question. But yeah, in the midst of the discussion, we, uh, we are solving more and more and we are improvising and kind of making up new question. But yeah, six weeks is right. Okay. Now, uh, the question, sadly, I have given a hint previously, but then nevertheless, let's try and solve the question, okay?
Okay, I'm waiting for the chat box to go buzzing. And yes, okay, can't see the screen. Okay, please somebody unmute and uh, tell me whether there is any problem with the transmission at your end. Is the question visible to everybody? Yeah, it is now. Previously, there was some black patch on the screen. It's gone. Okay, okay, okay. All right, yeah, we have got answers coming in. And okay, yeah. Now everybody is getting it correct, right? So let's just split up, split up and discuss the question. 26 year old, Gravida 2, 26, not a problem. Gravida 2, not a problem. Para 1, okay, no problem. On prophylactic LMWH for protein C deficiency. Okay, our first red flag and a heavy red flag. Protein C deficiency, all right. Now she had developed DVT in her last pregnancy three years ago. Okay, okay. So history of VTE. Okay, so that makes her antenatally. That makes Hi. her right, Hi. very good. But if you only take protein C deficiency, suppose she didn't have developed DVT, that point was not there, then protein C deficiency antenatally would be Intermediate risk. Excellent, excellent. I'm really mm -hmm. happy with you all. Okay, okay, okay. So now, now she self-administers LMWH at midday every day. Okay, so so far we have gotten along the question. They are not asking whether she needs LMWH or not. They are themselves telling us that she self-administers LMWH at midday every day. Midday is the catchword over here. Midday at 12 noon every day. Now she attends maternity unit at 36 weeks, three days at 4 p.m. with painful contractions and is found to be one centimeter dilated. Okay, fine. 12 noon, she, you have taken LMWH, 4 p.m. Everything is looking good. We are progressing with a plan of vaginal birth. But at 5 p.m., the obstetric team decided to deliver her by CS due to abnormal CTG trace. All right. So now only five hours Till her LMWH dose. And that LMWH was prophylactic or therapeutic? What do you think? Not that it matters for solving the question, but just to get a more practice. Excellent. Exactly. That is prophylactic. Exactly. So only five hours had passed. So we cannot break the spine. So we will go with cesarean section under GA. Okay, we don't prick the spine, we don't interfere with the spine, we directly use bag mask and we put her under GA and we get her operated. Okay, how it was the prophylactic dose? Okay, okay, this over here she had developed DVT in her last pregnancy three years ago. All right, we are not telling that she is having DVT in this pregnancy. She had history of DVT. That is a history of venous thromboembolism in previous pregnancy. Okay. She had come to us. She had history of a DVT in previous pregnancy. And she was diagnosed to have protein C deficiency. And now she has come to us with pregnancy. In this pregnancy, so far, everything is going good. She doesn't have DVT in this particular pregnancy. But... She had DVT in previous pregnancy. That is a history of BTE. So if there is a history of BTE, we will definitely, you know, make her a high-risk patient antenatally. Okay. So previously, we discussed an example. Okay, with the uh, Sorry? It would be, a, okay, it would be a prophylaxis, but with a high dose. Yeah. Uh, okay. Prophylaxis with a high dose. Okay, now prophylaxis with a high dose. Okay, we will again open up the chart. It will only become prophylaxis with high dose if there were three points. History of BTE and the patient had antithrombin 3 deficiency or APLA. Nobody said protein C deficiency, all right? Okay. Oh, it's only, okay, thank you. No, 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 no. 
there can also be a second uh, second situation that might satisfy your okay. uh, suppose she had a history of bte but she is on anticoagulant till present day and suddenly she becomes pregnant then mm -hmm. in that case it will be high dose all right okay because we are now making questions out of questions so yeah that can be a scenario that is if she have had a prophylactic uh, she had a history of bte and was continuing on uh, anticoagulants and on, she was never off anticoagulants then that would be a so very high, high factor see so high dose but should we take it as a therapeutic dose like we have to stop it 24 hours before no or it no, will be prophylactic it, it will, will be, be prophylactic. High dose prophylactic. It will be prophylactic even... always. Yeah, okay, it is okay. prophylactic. Okay. So okay. this was the uh, page I was uh, slide I was looking for. Previous history of VTE. The patient had DVT previous pregnancy, but protein C is not there. It's not there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So keep yeah, it in I mind. Got it. Thank you. Okay. 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 Something else in the chat box. Ma'am, I'm confused whether when to give LMWH for 10 days or for six weeks. Okay, okay. We will be looking at the postnatal profile access charts for that. See, antenatal is very clear. Okay, antenatally we start from the booking visit or from the 28 weeks. Okay, now postnatally we continue till six weeks. We continue till six weeks for which cases? If she had a previous VTE, if she had high risk thrombophilia, if she had low risk thrombophilia and family history, if she had antenatal LMWH, okay, then we will continue till six weeks after delivery. Suppose the patient has intermediate risk factors, then only we will continue till 10 days profile access. For intermediate risk factor, these are the risk factors. All right. Okay. But if her score uh, is four from the low risk factors, she will need prophylaxis for six weeks, right? Yeah. If the score is four from low risk factors, from the antenatal period of time, then only, then straightforward, she needs to continue till six weeks. That only comes into the doctor's mind when she comes to her antenatally. That, okay, you have got this four risk factors. I mean, I mean you will postpartum. Continue. Sorry? I mean, I mean postpartum, after she delivers. If she has four uh, low risk factors, she will need to have uh, six weeks of uh, low molecular weight heparin. Okay, okay. No, actually, let me go back to the slides. Postnatally, if there are low risk factors like soap versus film factors, which we discussed earlier, and the mode of delivery, I need to go back to that slide. Yeah, this one. See, she has delivered. Now we are reassessing. Suppose a okay. patient has come to us for the first time and we are checking her factors for the first time postnatally. No mm. matter if the score is 2, 4, 5, whatever it is, profile access will be at least 10 days. Then after 10 days, we will reassess the factors. And if <clears throat> the factors are persistent, then we will continue with uh, continue with profile access. All right? Okay. But not straightforward saw, like 6 weeks. Is, uh, the second question that we solved uh, that um, the answer was D, I think. Second question mm. postnatally, hyperemesis, no. After the dose timings? No, this one, not this one. Oh, where the patient had a BMI of 34. BMI of 34. Let me find it out. I think the next one. 42. Yes, this one. of 34. Yeah. Why did we give her? Uh, the answer was C or D? The answer was C or D because she yeah. has presented to us 
her booking yeah. weight was 96 her bmi was 34 she is a smoker see all these factors which we are okay. taking into account these are certain factors which can't be changed that won't see suppose a bmi is 34 that won't go below 30 after mm. you know 10 days right those are non changeable factors that is yes. the constant factors and why we are asking for reassessment let me show you for this particular slide after 10 days we reassess reassess for if she if this readmission factor is solved if this prolonged yeah. admission factor is solved these are changeable factors the bmi won't you know change the mode of delivery all these are so you mean okay. if she had she already had four factors prior to delivery during the prior antenatal Yeah, yeah she will be taking a six weeks uh, she will get uh, till six weeks yeah yeah clear way it's okay okay right. yeah now understand so, yeah thank you okay yeah saira had the same uh, opinion in mind i think but ma'am if antenatal go for the antenatal and postnatal six weeks yeah then and there the decision is taken antenatally she comes to us we see then and there our decision is taken that it will be till six weeks so no problem with that because all these are you know unchangeable kind of a factor non modifiable non modifiable risk factors all right it's uh, done uh, to, uh, if, to... We, if you can check the guideline the postnatal mm-hmm. assessment hmm this um, this uh, chart shows the true or moderate risk factor then the patient has to be referred in the intermediate risk two okay. or more so, yeah two or more two or more that is what we also discussed in this slide let me show you so intermediate risk at least 10 days but that is two huh hmm. yeah more more than three two or we more we can consider hmm. to extend it up to six weeks that is it see on on this hmm. page we have two or more factors prophylactic for at least 10 days 10 now days, yeah. at the end of 10 days what did we talk about the intermediate risk factor at least 10 days of prophylaxis then if factors persist then consider persist extending days. okay nowhere in the guideline nowhere have they mentioned that straight forward we take a decision of 6 weeks everywhere it is written that then consider extending prophylaxis yeah unless the okay. question already implies that she was taking a uh, antenatal prophylactic dose or low molecular weight heparin even if it doesn't say uh, straight forward that she is taking but if she has more than 3 or 4 risk factors antenatally she will be already taking low molecular weight heparin so and she will be will taking continue for further 6 weeks. weeks yeah okay six yeah six weeks her entire why we are telling 6 weeks see because 6 weeks is your entire pure perium in yes. pure perium the risk of pte is more that was one of the very first slides when my you know presentation was getting stuck yeah, postpartum yeah. the five fold risk increases so mm. if there is a very high risk factor antenatally we straight forward take a decision that yes you need to continue till 6 weeks after delivery yes okay. okay thank you okay 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 yeah thank so, you yeah thank you okay okay acha just uh, let me see where were we i think we were yeah cs under ga this question we had done now we are coming to a emq this is from one of the practice books these are the options obviously when you will go and uh, do our emq workshop uh, there will be our mentors who will be telling you for emqs we don't need to screen through all of these at once obviously you also know by all means of practicality we first take a look at the question okay a 28 year old primary presented to accident and emergency at 16 weeks of gestation with chest pain and breathlessness she smokes 15 cigarettes per day and has not seen her midwife or gp yet for her pregnancy booking on examination she is very pale dyspneic with a pulse rate of 112 per minute and a respiratory rate of 30 per minute she is clinically stable and is admitted to hdu okay okay this i can give you a hint because technically this is um from gtg 37b 
but then why i put the question here because i have actually discussed i have discussed yes i was expecting this answer yes i was expecting this answer see now now what happens the patient has come and she is having dyspnea she is having pulmonary embolism now is the confusion whether we go with c or with g or we go with k all right this is from one of the practice books what we feel is that initial resuscitation basic blood work up and everything is required for this particular patient but but she's already admitted to Uh, she has presented to the accident and emergency yeah what is your next best step but it's a life saving kind of a scenario so here the best option that we can choose is commence lmwh 1.5 mg per kg body weight or that is what the answer has been provided in the practice book that c is the option but there is also an option k initial resuscitation basic blood work up coagulation profile and lft this is also maybe, looking like maybe, a tempting yeah. option maybe because the question says that she is already admitted to the high dependency unit and maybe she is she had already had her initial resuscitation initial and work up yeah. done right yeah. so maybe that's one of the things that people now sorry Uh, maybe that's why the answer should be to commence low molecular weight heparin immediately yes so we can take it as a hint that is why i had put it there as well that there is a uh, question in get through emq in the slides i have mentioned because this is one of the confusing questions but the answer over here is commence lmwh 1.5 mg per kg body weight because initial basic life saving measures have already been taken so we will go with commencing lmwh at 1.5 mg per kg body weight all right so this is a question from get through where they have gone with this particular option all right now uh, we are moving to the next question a 37 year old postnatal mother presents with calf pain she is diagnosed with recurrent dvt and receives therapeutic doses of lmwh further evaluation shows a right common iliac pain thrombus okay now we will have a look at the options can you tell me what exactly was the buzzword amongst those four lines that we had in the question yeah Very yeah we can dvt on low on therapeutic yeah. exactly exactly i think you have all gone through the guidelines yeah you are well prepared i feel you are quite prepared you have picked up recurrent dvt recurrent dvt is the buzzword and when there is recurrent dvt we don't need to calculate 37 therapeutic this that risk factors no we will straight forward go and mark a we need carva filters okay because this is the one question that comes straight forward recurrent dvt and we uh, put in carva filters okay right so now i have a booster slide for you all because you know this is now today our all of us are focusing on bte we are now not thinking of recurrent miscarriage when we start thinking of recurrent miscarriage and bte and everything together on the day of the exam then things get confusing so just boost a slide it is not important from question solving aspect because such questions i don't think have come these are not direct repeat questions but then just to clear your concepts suppose there is apla and there is a history of recurrent miscarriage all right a patient comes with she has been diagnosed as apla and she has a history of recurrent miscarriage what do we do then the answer would be aspirin with lmwh up to 35 weeks 
This is one of the special things from the recurrent miscarriage, LMWH up to 35 weeks. All right. So aspirin we are putting not for prophylaxis, but we are putting from prevention aspect of recurrent miscarriage. Okay. Suppose APLA is detected only. Now this cannot be a real life situation. We detect APLA only when a patient comes with us with thromboembolism, then we check. Only if the patient comes with recurrent miscarriage, then we check her while she is non-pregnant. That is why we, when we do an APLA screen, a normal patient having neither VTE, neither recurrent miscarriage, we never check for APLA. But just to make you understand, I'm telling that APLA, if it is only detected, then it will be score one. So APLA alone is not a high risk factor. It's a low risk factor. It only gets scored one. And we will give LMWH if there are more factors there, like her age, like her parity, like her obesity, that will add up to the score. All right. So APLA alone is not a threat to us. It is only getting a timid score of one. So, but when APLA has a history of VTE, then it becomes very high risk. Okay then it will become high dose, it will require high dose LMWH right from the very start till six weeks after. What we have been confusing in the last few minutes, whether or not till six weeks after, definitely till six weeks after, okay? Non-negotiable. It's not like APLA with a history of VTE. We know that postpartum, the patient is more at risk of developing a VTE. And then at de after delivery, we are stopping and thinking, no. The decision taken then and there antenatally that she will have this high dose LMWH till six weeks after. Okay, so no change of plans after she delivers. In such a high risk patient, we have to continue till six weeks. So this is just a booster slide to get your concepts clear. It's kind of a merger between this guideline and the recurrent uh, miscarriage guideline. Okay, yeah, somebody raised a hand. If you can please unmute and uh, ask your question. Dr. Nahim. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very please. much. What is this dose of um, high dose prophylactic LM um, low molecular weight heparin? Okay. The regular what is one the is high... one milligram per kg. So, what is yeah. high dose? The guideline mentions it is 50 to 75% of the treatment dose. All right. So, if we are giving a prophylactic dose, of one milligram per kg once daily. So 50 to 75% extra we need to give. All right. Or what another point that we have discussed is that for high risk, for high risk group, that is very high risk group, we can also give the same dose twice daily. That is one milligram per kg twice daily. It was there in one of the slides. Let me show you. High risk would be antenatal high dose LMWH twice daily dosing. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, somebody is unmute, I think, by accident or somebody needs to ask something. Okay, I think no queries. Moving on. Who all are the candidates ideal for thrombophilia testing? Well, this is something that is there in the guideline. No questions have been asked so far in neither of the practice books or so far in the recalls. But is there in the guidelines, when you go through the guidelines, maybe you'll wonder about this point. So I'm telling, just look at this part first. With prior history of VTE, a patient has a history of VTE. And if there is a family history of VTE, okay, the patient is coming telling that I have had VTE, my mother had also had VTE, then we will check for antithrombin 3 deficiency first. All right. But suppose if she comes with a prior history of VTE and there is no family history associated, then we check for APLA first because APLA is an acquired thrombophilia. 
rest of the other thrombophilias are all hereditary okay apla is acquired and makes it a non hereditary point so if there is no family history for unprovoked bte we will check for apla okay now moving to this side suppose a patient comes with no prior history or risk factors for bte the patient has come to our clinic and asking us that okay doctor i am planning to get pregnant i have never had bte but my family member my mother had an unprovoked bte or estrogen provoked bte estrogen provoked bte means suppose my mother was on coc pills and she had an history of bte and the doctor said that probably the coc pills had led to this particular bte so that would be an estrogen provoked bte okay so the patient herself doesn't have any history but the immediate first degree family member had had a history of estrogen provoked bte at the age less than 50 then we consider for thrombophilia testing all right this slide i know after adding so many factors so many things in mind might appear a bit more clustered no questions have come so far from this but it is there in the guidelines it is my duty to just simplify and let you know we never know if a question can come out of it but so far it's not important if you look at the recall papers but this will go by the heading who all are the candidates ideal for thrombophilia testing all right now contraindication yeah about okay, the previous yeah. slide yeah so mm -hmm. a family history with a personal history you check for antithrombin deficiency right right and uh, yeah. uh, uh, an only personal history with, of unprovoked vte you check for an antiphospholipid syndrome right yeah because and then, uh, a family history only you check for uh, what, what thrombophilia do you check for If you, if, then if we the test patient... for all. Yeah, all okay. from a few. Okay. Because she has, she is now having no, uh, you know, um, check for a V. She is not having a personal history. She has not had a VT herself. But okay. But we are checking for thrombophilia, as in all the hereditary ones. Okay. 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 Because uh, other than APLA, everything else is hereditary. APLA can mm -hmm. happen one off. Nobody in the family had APLA. Suddenly. the patient yeah. herself develops that is how it okay. goes now we have met apla patients in our clinical practice so that's it but whenever the hereditary factor is coming into play then we will stick to the non apla things that is protein c protein s antithrombin 3 fat prothrombin gene mutation all those are more notorious because they are born by the genetics but apla is something that is acquired okay okay so, thank you right so contraindication to lmwh once again this is a chart which we uh, need to go through because of course technically it is important but uh, so far we have not come across questions but definitely it's worth your while to just go through the slide and know what are the points before starting lmwh which are the acute contraindications all right all right so i think uh um, we have discussed a lot today it was a very fruitful discussion i am very happy with your response that you asked questions that you all were happily involved and engaged is what i was really hoping to have an audience like and moving on a stitch in time saves nine why do i say this i don't know i think many of you are very well prepared i don't know when you are planning to appear for mrcog part 2 but the exam on 16th of january is technically just 75 days away from now right if you haven't calculated okay okay uh, oh thank you thank you saira i am glad that you liked it so a stitch in time saves nine so 75 days to go we have to have a structured game plan we have to have uh you know okay there's a question about ma'am if we just go through the slides okay are we good to go for the exam okay then i'll move you all to my very first slide 
what i consider ideal is learning the guideline in a simplified manner i think we have kind of simplified things and this particular presentation kind of covers everything okay which have come in the exams which might come in the exams question solving in segments yes that have also mm -hmm. that we have also covered today so memorize the class slides that is non negotiable you have to read through the guideline i would suggest but okay if suppose you are not having enough time before january session memorize the class slides maybe have a glance through the you know the algorithms at the back of the gtg but let me assure you i have lifted the charts and prepared them from the algorithms from the back i have read through the guideline if you don't have the time maybe not because see mrcog part 2 is not about getting a 100 on 100 it's about you know getting a certain percentile this should cover a greater part of your syllabus if your understanding is clear you should be able to you know cover 95% of the questions that may come now if suppose there is somewhere in the guideline a particular percentage or a particular trial that has been mentioned which has never come before and now they have formulated a new question that new question is a new question for everybody if you don't have time if you're now thinking of studying smart and not studying hard then okay i think the slides are enough okay because new questions okay they might come out of a trial men mention somewhere it's a 40 page guideline but comprehensively it covers okay can we have the slides or recording okay this is uh, up to the team to decide they will be deciding and uh, anam or anybody from the med exam team can we have can we take call on that whether they can have the slides i think it will be available the recording of the session would be available yeah so all right now we yeah. have 70 okay yes, yeah session yeah. recording will be available yeah it will be available okay. and yeah yeah we can proceed that's great okay 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 thank you anam so okay now we have got 75 strategic days in hand and that is the time when we need to we have studied hard i can make out because of course you have been answering questions like anything i know that you have got the gist of how to go about the preparation but this 75 days are very important in order to study smart to focus on what all is important to cover maximum part of the syllabus it's not about getting a 100 on 100 it's about cracking the right percentile and to focus on the most asked areas so medexam expert has actually taken uh, designed a course for you the progressive course for mrcog part 2 here what we are going to do is for the last 75 days that we have in time this course will start from 8th of november 8th of november i think you will be having 69 days till 16th of january i can tell you how many days maybe you are now calculating but i know because we are a team who have been formulating the day to day basis you know the timeline the time table how we are going to discuss how we are going to uh, complete all the important topics till your exam comes up over here we have first we have the topic discussions then we again have the discussions of the recall questions and we take the discussions forward and then the last 7 days are your own free days we will be there to support you to solve your questions to solve your queries for boosting up boosting up your morale but the last 7 days you will be reading on your own but from 8th november till i think 9th of january there will be non stop discussion sessions on all the important aspects that we must must go through before appearing for the exam now how are we going to have this discussion every day we will be allotting certain topics a very systematic chart on time table we have prepared every day we will be allotting topics throughout the day you will be going ahead and covering the topics on your own and taking help from the audio notes by mentors which will be provided to you on the website taking help from the library which is also provided to you on the website 
and then at 2.30 p.m. GMT or 1.30 p.m. GMT, roughly around the same time when we took the session today, we will have a discussion where we'll, we'll be giving you the booster slides, what are the important points, what you must know, and all your doubt clearance and solving. That we will take up every day pertaining to these topics. Doesn't mean that you can't have a question outside these topics. Of course, you're welcome. But it's a very structured strategy that we have planned so that till seven days before the exam, till 9th January, we have completed the important talks, the important GTGs, the recall questions. Okay, we will first take up the fresh recalls and then we will go back. Recall of 2023, then 2022, and then we will try and finish till 2016, okay, by the 9th of Jan. And then we will have we will give you seven free days when you will be just, you know, revising. We will be there to support you. The entire discussion will be on Telegram, okay? So we will be sharing charts. You'll be sharing your voice notes, your queries. We will be there with you. And this is a progressive course, how we have designed for you. Myself, Dr. Manjir Mitra and Dr. Rupam Jain would be the co-mentors uh, co on this particular course. We will also have audio notes of the other mentors associated with MedExam Expert. The recordings will be given to you on the platform. And as promised, we do have a particular gift awaited for you. That is, if you enroll in the progressive course, MedExam Expert had been very kind in providing me with this particular coupon, Dr. Manji. If you use this particular coupon when you are checking out, getting this course, it will directly give you a discount of hundred dollars okay but this coupon will be valid till 7th november only on 8th november our classes will be starting okay okay so thank you so much thank you so that would be all it was truly a pleasure having you all with me despite a little bit of technical glitches at the beginning but it was a very engaging session i think all the doubts have been cleared if you have any more doubts, please feel free to ask right now. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I think, yeah, all the problems solved. Now you can go solve your questions and see if GTG 37A makes sense, if it is easy for us to solve now. Okay? So thank you, everyone. I hope to meet you all in some other session, some other course very soon and if not i hope to see you all wearing this particular apron the particular um mrcog convocation pig that we all have i hope to see you all in that particular attire someday very soon will there be a session for gtg 37b okay uh, i haven't planned as of now if you feel that you need i will definitely take it up you feel you need a GTG 37B? Okay, we can take it, take it up. It was very fruitful. Thank you, Dr. Mevish. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that you found it useful, Dr. Hanifa. Okay, okay. Yeah, Dr. Abid. Yeah. Then GTG 37B, we will take it up very soon. Okay, before 8, can we have GTG 37B lecture as well? It was amazing. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, then GTG 37B done before 8. Yeah we will have GTG 37B. Let me figure out with our team and we will let you know on the platform. Okay. 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 So then thank you so much with this. It's a wrap for today, but see you all very soon in some other session. Okay. Thank you all.